my exposure to to uh, practices of injustice or, or human rights violations, I'm sure it goes pretty much to our childhoods because where I'm from, and this is the region of Bo the Balkans, it's a very complex childhood, especially for the generations such as mine. Um, because I think in all the countries uh, of the region, we the, the, the kids were surrounded by the realities of war, um, deep economic deprivation, poverty, um, uh, but also this sentiment of excluding everyone who um, who was different for some reason, and I think this also through through school later on, uh, having experienced this myself, this kind of exclusion and targeting um, of based on on your own diversity or, or the, the, the differences might have also contributed to this kind of a sense that that um, that there is an utmost value in human dignity, that there is this utmost value in, in diversity and, and, um, and respect, equal respect for everyone as a human being. And then at some point, a couple of years later, I, I really got interested into disability and human rights. Uh, due to um, a summer school that was organized in, uh, in Hungary, I do remember it quite clearly by a civil society organization, that just changed the way I perceive diversity and how I perceive um, disability and, and uh, this kind of a, a social richness, as I like to call it. Um, so I went a little bit more actively into civil society work. I really wanted to be connected to the ground. What really gave me uh, an added perspective, what really opened my eyes and put me in contact with the reality was when I joined um, the National Preventive Mechanisms Against Torture and started visiting the, um, the places of de facto detention, the places in which persons with disabilities resided and lived and still do in, in the majority of, of countries in the world. Um, most uh, likely and usually against their own will, uh, without having a, a simple say in where they live, how they're treated, how they live their lives, what they do on daily, and when they eat, when they sleep, when they socialize, what clothes they wear. And the contact with those realities in social care institutions in, um, in the Balkans and Eastern Europe, and whatever we were reading and knowing about and, and, and uh, advocating for, those were uh, such revealing experiences. Those were just insights that change your life in a way. Um, so the institutionalization as a particular aspect of a fight for, um, for equality and, and non-discrimination of persons with disabilities is one of the most important features. It really stays uh, that to this day, and I'm, I'm always very happy to, to have discussions on this topic, especially now when we have um, certain progress, like the, the most recent guidelines on how institutionalization should be done at the national level and so on. Because I do believe that this still represents one of the uh, most inhumane and most serious forms of discrimination and, and violation of human rights today. Um, since, simply because those realities in which you live in group homes um, are questioning the core of your human dignity and, and, and the core of your existence as a human being and really not really treating persons who live there and who are placed in those institutions as, um, as a valid say-maker um, in any decision that concerns their own life. And um, why this topic is still so relevant? Well, the practices do say that institutional care is still largely predominant uh, in comparison to um, independent living or living in the support in the, in the community, living equally um, with others and not being segregated, not being secluded, not being subjected to many other negative and violent practices. So I think this is why um, 
it is very important to keep this this topic in focus because just due to the due to the fact that it is so tough and so unpleasant for so many people and it does not go in line with what the majority of our general population think um, not to mention decision makers and that states um, it, it, is, it, it is really easy to to lose it from focus, to lose it from the center of attention. I think this is very important for those people not to be forgotten, for those children who live, uh, many of them from the day of their birth, in those uh, secluded, um, closed institutions, and spend their, own, their, their whole life, and many of them died there, many of them spend the entire childhood in there, and are being you know tortured and subjected to a human degrading treatment. Those, I mean, these people should not be forgotten, and these people should be um, allowed the access to, to the rights that they are uh, guaranteed by the United Nations uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is to really have a say and to choose uh, their own life and their own modality of, of life, love, work. What also motivates me. Um, after having, you know, spent several years working now in the United Nations Human Rights, is these small wins, this, this small progress, and usually more often than not, the the progress that is tangible that you actually can measure and see is uh, a result of a million steps, of a million back and forths, of of so many hours of work, days of work, negotiations back and forth, and it's really complex, it cannot be measured in, in regular terms, usually. Uh, so those small wins when they're, especially in certain areas, like I, I mentioned disability, but also small wins in other policy areas, those mean a lot. Not only to us as, as people working on it, but you, you, can, you can feel what kind of impact it has on, on right holders, on, 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 on people in communities, on individuals um, that are being affected the most. So the impact um, and just these small shifts, they, they, really, they really can be very motivating. I think regardless of where we are and where I am personally, um, in our area of work, who really always inspires me and brings this en extra engine to all of our work are the human rights defenders and the, the, the human rights advocates. Regardless of where they are situated, they, they can be a civil society, they can be um, human rights advocates sitting in the organizations, in, in uh, the governments, and there are many of them in the governments. Um, but I think their motivation, their dedication, and their um, sheer optimism that fight for human rights is worthwhile and it makes sense is something that I find truly inspirational. We can really try to motivate um, individuals and groups and peoples around us to just keep doing the simple stuff that contribute to human rights culture, to, to um, uh, accountability of institutions, to um, stopping impunity, um, to all those you know to all those values that we are already advocating for. Um, things such as uh, don't ignore the domestic violence when you hear it through your walls or through your doors or you hear about it. Report it. Reach out to the victim. Reach out to, uh, to the children. Um, do everything in your power on an everyday basis to preserve the environment. Um, go and vote. Promote voting. A responsible ex a responsible approach to voting among your friends and your family um, uh, promotes the value and and um, and the value of, of diversity among your children among your family members regardless of the generation um, this is also standing up this is also standing up for human rights and values don't um, don't let certain jokes slide um, uh, without you maybe using this opportunity to, to share a piece of mind, a piece of, of information.
I really feel very close and very very much triggered, I would say, by, by Article 25, which is the, the ethical standard of living, because it simply encompasses, on one hand, the right to exercise um, all those entitlements that lead ultimately to a, a, a dignified, adequate life. But on the other, on the other side, it actually talks about the, the, the human rights duties of states in securing those basic values that are, um, that are of utmost importance and essential for our life and for our dignity.